In the 2016 year-end episode, I mentioned that there's a bunch of stuff I need to figure out regarding Reasonably Sound. Like, where exactly Reasonably Sound fits? What kind of podcast is it? What kind of sound podcast specifically? What kind of whatever kind of sound podcast it is? And so on and so forth, infinitely regressing until I'm pulling out what's left of my hair, paralyzed by the impossible task of deciding what the show is before actually continuing to make it, instead of letting its isness emerge naturally out of the many smaller and much easier to make decisions that occur on a day to day and episode to episode basis. So I know it's not sexy. And I know that it's more than a little navel-gazy, maybe a tad self-indulgent, even for a podcast made by one dude, which seems like something of an accomplishment. But I feel like I'm not going to be able to navigate through this kind of thinking without doing it in public. And for whoever has the patience and interest to listen through this sort of thing, I'm curious where we align and don't regarding thoughts about this little show about sounds. Which is to say, I hope you'll indulge my self-indulgence and I hope I'm not being too self-important by hoping that you'll respond to my self-indulgence in some way. That's what this short rumination episode is. A little thinking about Reasonably Sound's mission, for lack of a less grandiose word. Intent, maybe? Aim? Thing I'd like to do with it, you know? This is going to kind of be based in part on what the show seems to be, considering past episodes, and also in part on what my aims for it are considering what's coming up. That involves talking a little bit about audio, listening, the ear, and how each functions in day-to-day -day experience. So, okay, here we go. Ideally, I think there's a bit of a story to Reasonably Sound overall, where both you and I learn together about the increasingly unexpected places we may find ideas about hearing, listening, and sound. I have a background in music and sound and making records and doing all kinds of audio things professionally, but I'm not an acoustician or an audio ecologist. I'm not a physicist or a neurologist. Heck, I'm not even really a critic or a theorist. I just play one on the internet. So I want to be clear that we're always learning stuff together, at least as best as a format where I make something, upload it, and you listen to it allows for that to be the case, but that's another conversation for another day. The unexpected roles and hiding places of listening is a thing that I want to learn more about, with you, ideally. And for the record, I'm totally on board with Pauline Oliveros' listening slash hearing distinction that we talked about in the last episode. Hearing is the operation of a physiological apparatus which turns pressure changes into electrical impulses in the brain, while listening is the active appraisal of those impulses by a consciousness and the apprehension of them as sounds with various levels of meaning. More so than a podcast about specific sounds as such, their history or construction or the personalities related to those things, my hope is that Reasonably Sound can show where listening happens and the impact listening has on people, animals, and their environment. How listening helps build an image of the world and helps, in a way, develop an idea of who we are, or in some cases, even guides or forces that process. The show started with episodes about the ear and the voice, and we've moved since then into variously far-flung sound territories. Overused sound effects and auditory illusions are one territory. Racial dog whistles, in some sense deeply metaphorical with regards to the idea of listening, is another perhaps comparably distant territory, but within the border of listening nonetheless, I think. It isn't that any one territory is itself remote here. Only in comparison to another may one topic feel distant. This is part of the plan. I hope that after a while we end up building a model of listening that's more complex or nuanced or just more, I don't know, multifaceted than the one most of us normally have because of all of the strange places we've seen listening plausibly in action throughout different episodes of the show. I want to talk more about that normal model of listening, but first, one other way to think about this is 
what do we consider sonic in Before Hedgehog jokes? Sound design, speech, and music are unequivocally sonic, but are speech patterns or rhetorical techniques sonic? Are musical forms or tropes themselves sonic? The textual representation of sounds, the physical design of instruments, the law as it relates to recordings, or the psychological effects of constant exposure to sounds above the range of human hearing, are those things sonic? In the same way we might try to show the edges of listening, I hope we can try to explore the depth of the sonic and to increasingly discover surprising things which are at base, or in some significant way, exactly that. And this is one way, I think, that we can discover how we might be listening, but not realizing it. If something is unexpectedly sonic, though maybe not sound as such, does it still engage us in a type of listening? Listening in a way that we would have never naturally considered? How does that unexpected listening then affect our everyday lived experience, perhaps in quiet and unexpected ways? And if we're attuned to those effects, how has our perception changed? What related skills might we be building? And this brings me to the other big aim that I have for Reasonably Sound. And it's that if we're talking about sound, I think in some way we're talking critically. And that thinking about sound is also always thinking critically. It feels fair to say that people consider visual culture the primary sense culture. I certainly feel that way. The sentiment does feel a little strange to make hyper-confidently in this the age of the podcast, a medium which may be challenging that hasty generalization a tad, but on the whole, seeing is often considered the sense par excellence. It's the one we tend to rely on and consider the most. The visual sense is the sense most well-trained, the most skeptical sense, except maybe taste, and the sense most often purposefully appealed to by forces outside of our own bodies. There is a little bit of research which challenges this notion, which says, actually, the world is heard much more than we give it credit. And while the world is perhaps not nearly as listened to as it is seen Neither is hearing a sense whose impact pales in comparison to sight. And broadly speaking, I'm on board with this claim. And I think part of the fun of Reasonably Sound is, like we just talked about, the possibility of showing how and where listening happens in ways and places totally unobserved. What I do think is true is that our grasp on listening and on the sonic and our ability to talk about those things isn't as strong as it is with seeing. And it's probably worth saying that when I say we and our grasp, I'm casting a really wide net here, a very self-consciously wide net. This we that I'm talking about is a complicated one, even among the relatively select group that is reasonably sound listeners. What I mean is that, in my experience, people in general have less confidence actively using their sense of hearing and talking about the effects or experiences of listening than they do when it comes to their sense of sight and even their sense of taste. This is the case even when audio experiences are profound, impactful, or even formative. One reason for this, in my estimation at least, is that sound is abstract. Having no physical presence and being an effect process, which exists not only in space, but unfolds in time, eventually dissipating when its source ceases, sound is, by its essence, ephemeral. Our reactions, descriptions, explanations, and dissections of it tend to be largely metaphorical, often leaning on other sense vocabulary in order to give a body to the bodiless to give form to the formless and a stable existence to the fleeting. To grapple with talk of the sonic is to bend and twist language into abstract spaces it often isn't meant to fill, but does regardless. To describe a sound as shimmering, 
deep, warm, or piercing, one communicates the metaphorical, physical apprehension of the experience of an abstract sense event. One is making critical use of one's own consciousness and critical use of language, showing a foundation of meaning and experience which is plumbed both more often and more instinctively with other senses. For most of us, sonic experience is a struggle to understand what is happening to our bodies and our ears and our minds and our persons. And such a struggle is, in my opinion at least, always critical. It is always seeking to uncover the base causes and hidden reasons that things are the way they are, the conditions which give rise to an effect an experience, a feeling, or a result. When we talk about sound, we are talking in theory. Sound exists in practice, but as it fleets and dissipates, since its apprehension defeats the more confident senses, and we talk about its characteristics or impacts through metaphor or code, we almost must talk about it in theory. We do talk about its source, methods of its production, measurable aspects of its transmission concretely, though arguably never directly. And to discuss the sound object itself, one is always confronting a transient, effective, often indefinite entity, something which must be represented, mentally reconstructed, and held onto in the space of the mind in order to be appreciated once it has passed, which it almost always will. And just a bit of a digression here, I'm not trying to suggest that there's no theoretical position to be had when it comes to the objects of other senses. To claim visual objects aren't the subject of theory would be absurd, since quite the opposite is true. If anything, most sense theory draws primarily from visual experience. Similarly, it wouldn't be fair to say that sound is the only fleeting object of sense experience. Smell, touch, and taste also exist in time as events and retreat from experience once their source has concluded, so to speak. But I do think it's fair to say that in comparison to sound, there is much less of a social, commercialized experience of those other senses with elements of architecture, infrastructure, technology, and aesthetics at their forefront, as is the case with sound. Of course, the other element here is that my interest and expertise is in sound, so perhaps I'm wrong or biased. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely biased. Nonetheless, what I mean to say is that while it doesn't hold a sole claim to such a relationship, I think it is a fair claim to say that an interest and understanding of sound is in some way contiguous with an interest and understanding of theory, of what it means to theorize, and what it means to involve oneself in all of the pursuits which use theory. Science, philosophy, art, criticism, psychology, psychoanalysis, and so on. And furthermore, that when one theorizes, one is composing with abstract elements, a system of symbolic meaning, often open to interpretation in a way comparable to how one might compose with or appreciate the composition of sound. In other words, to make a case for the exploration of sonic experience, one makes the case for an exploration of theory. And in the exploration of theory, one engages in an exploration much like that to be found with sound, music, and listening. John Cage suggested that every listener is also a composer, and I may go one step further and say that every listener not hearer, but listener, is also a theorist. I'm interested in this because I think theory is important. Knowing how theory works, how to do it, and knowing what we can accomplish by actively theorizing about our world makes us more powerful within it. But often the banner of theory and theorizing is intimidating or misunderstood. Aside from sound itself, talking and theorizing about sound maybe outside many people's comfort zones. But my hope is that as listening beings, as social listeners, the content of our experiences can give us the confidence 
to have those conversations and formulate those theories where we may feel wholly unprepared with regards to theory in general, which doesn't necessarily always relate to lived experience. Most people have personal experiences related to listening. And my hope is that in the process of charting the breadth and depth of those experiences on Reasonably Sound, we may also make a case for the usefulness of theory and show its practical application to everyday life and everyday experience and the power or insight that that application can afford us. There's a lot to say, or really I have a lot to say, about the place of theory in life and what it's good for. But I'm going to leave that as the big story to tell, as the thing that we're going to figure out, hopefully together, for however long we do this show for. This rumination has been reasonably sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at reasonably SND. If you want to support the show, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. You can find me on most social media at Mike Rugnetta. Reasonably Sound's music is by Will Stratton and visual design by Tita Tepp. The age of the podcast 